is one hundred word summary, and many of you have done it, a few have not done it. <laughs> and um, the deadline for that is next Thursday, 5 p.m. I think you have enough time to do that. And this lecture is also recorded, and by Monday we are going to have a, or even by later today, we are going to have it on Canvas. So some of you who have already told me that they cannot be here today, or you, if you want to take some parts of it, you can go back and go to the lecture and then submit your comments. Okay? So with this one, I will turn the paper around. Any questions about those? I think Bob is too quick. Okay. So let me um, thank our speaker today, um, Stefano Ambrosio, who came to us here from IBM, Amazon, and um, I think Nark is going to speak about neuromorphic computation, and it's a very interesting and very um, firm topic, and we all learn from that today. And I'd like to just say a few words towards about Stefano. He received his master's degree in electrical engineering from the Polytechnic of Milano in Milano, Italy, and then also from the CSD in Italy in 2016, under the supervision of his professor, Daniel Germini. Yes. Um, and his work was on the reliability of repeated memories and their application on neuromorphic computing. So then, um, <coughs> Stefano came to IBM in Alvin Bean the last year, and he has spent a lot of time on the topic he's going to present today. And uh, I would encourage you to um, write your questions, and at the end, we'll try to finish around this presentation around 12.40 or so, so you can have the opportunity to ask a few questions. Right. So, Stefano, thank you. Thank you. So, can you hear me? Yes. So first of all, I'm glad to be here, and I thank Linda for inviting me. And today I'm talking about uh, neuromorphic computation. So what we are doing uh, in Amaden and what our groups are doing uh, as researchers in the world uh, in this new topic, uh, what are the challenges we are facing with, uh, and what is going on. In my presentation, after an introduction, I will mainly focus on what uh, we are doing in Amaden, which is uh, training large neural networks uh, with the hardware accelerators based uh, on non-volatile memories, uh, which are a novel kind of memories uh, developed in recent years. After that, uh, I will talk about a novel kind uh, of uh, programming operation for devices uh, in neural networks, which is called spike time independent plasticity, which is based on one aspect uh, of how our brain works. After that, I will just uh, give some thoughts about uh, what we are facing next year, and then I will conclude my talk. So first of all, uh, what is cognitive computing, uh, which is this topic? Uh, we can define it as systems that learn at scale, uh, reason with purpose, and interact with humans naturally. This already exists uh, and has uh, a large impact uh, both on enterprise clients, and this is the case for IBM Watson, who is working with a lot of companies, but it has also a widespread impact uh, on everybody of us uh, in many aspects. For example, image recognition. Nowadays, uh, systems can have a nearly human-like uh, ability to recognize uh, features from real-world images and videos. Like, for example, in this case, uh, the system, which is a computer, actually, is able to recognize uh, the presence of a motorcycle, of a car, of a person, without uh, needing uh, an input from us as humans. Another field where there has been a huge improvement in the last years has been uh, speech recognition. Nowadays, we can talk with uh, our mobile phones, uh, like uh, Siri with Apple, we can have then Cortana with Microsoft, uh, Alexa with Amazon. It seems that they can understand us, so something seems to work. And then third point, uh, machine translation in the very last years uh, has really improved. Uh, for example, this sentence, uh, which is a Spanish one, uno no es lo que es por lo que escribe, sino por lo que ha leído, is now properly translated in uh, you are not what you write, but what you have read. And my mentor told me that somebody told him that the two at the bottom are right. I trust them because I don't know. But 
However, before 2016, uh, the translation, at least for English, was quite wrong because it was this one is not what is for what he writes, but for what he has read, which is not really correct in English. So how is it possible to have all these kind of uh, uh, improvements in the last years? It's because we are using widespread uh, deep neural networks, which are these some st structures from machine learning, and they work pretty well. However, our problems are not just limited to these three cases. Uh, we have many other challenges uh, from uh, an hardware point of view, but also from a software point of view in the ne next years uh, due to uh, Internet of Things. Uh, we know that we are living in an era where we have a lot of sensors, a lot of uh, like uh, mobile phones and uh, many things uh, which are collecting a lot of data and sending this data to the Internet. And we would like to do something with all this kind of data. And for example, we have situations where if we want to make this robot to walk, we would like to have some sort of artificial intelligence inside it, which makes him able to move into the real world without having any output input from us. So we need some intelligence inside it. But we need an intelligence, so we need a chip, which is low power because we cannot burn a lot of power in this kind of situations. Other situations which are Challenging are, for example, traffic monitoring, vehicle detection, drone navigation, or facial recognition. And finally, most important, in medicine, there are a lot of applications like epileptic seizure prediction. We want to be able to predict uh, crisis and so many other problems by injecting some sort of artificial intelligence directly where we want to have uh, some uh, knowledge. However, all these kind of operations are producing a, a large amount of data. What does it mean, large amount of data? It means a lot of data. There are some projections that say that around 2020, we will have something like uh, 44 zettabytes, which is 44 times 10 to the 21 bytes, uh, of data produced in just one year. And this data is unstructured data. So it's data like uh, audio, video, photos, sounds. Uh, it's not like uh, uh, homogeneous data but it's completely heterogeneous, which is bad to analyze. So first of all, how can we memorize all these quantities? Let's have just an idea and with an example of what is 44 zettabytes. If we memorize these 44 zettabytes in our uh, smartphones, we need so many smartphones that we would have the ability to cover an entire surface of New York with uh, two layers of smartphones. So we need a lot of memory. Up to now, we don't know exactly how to store all this data. And even if we know how to store this data, we don't know how to efficiently perform computation on this uh, situation. Because nowadays, uh, our computers are based on the von Neumann um, architecture, where we have a memory and a processor. And data goes from the memory to the processor. We perform computation, and computation results uh, are saved into the memory. But this going back and forth, uh, it's quite slow and inefficient uh, for analyzing large amounts of data. We need new architectures. And here is where we use neuromorphic architectures. Then third point, also if we are able to store and compute this data, how can we extract information from unstructured data? So what are the machine learning algorithms that we need? In conclusion, we have two questions. The first one is what we have now from the machine learning uh, community is uh, enough to deal with all these challenges? And second, are CMOS silicon-based devices, so the technology we have now, our computers, adequate to meet all these challenges? In my talk, I will try to give uh, an explanation and uh, our thinking about these two questions. So first of all, I talk about uh, neural networks. Uh, first thing to do is understand what is a neural network. A neural network is a network which is composed of many neurons, each of them connected through weights. So it's quite simple as a number of elements. We have a lot of these elements. And backpropagation is the algorithm to train these large networks. We can define it as a global learning rule for training fully connected convolutional neural networks. These are just two different types of the many types we can have of convolution of neural networks. So let's understand a little bit better what is a neuron in a neural network. Here is a, just a simple sketch. 
this neuron receives information from all the other neurons, uh, and this information, x, a1, a2, an, is weighted uh, through weights, uh, w. So the neuron simply receives uh, all these quantities and sums them. And after that, uh, this quantity, sum of x times w, w is passed through a nonlinearity, and this gives the output of the neuron. Why do we need the nonlinearity, which is, by the way, typically machine learning scientists use the rectified linear unit, which is just a diagonal, but is zero for negative values, hyperbolic tangent function or logistic function. Why do we really need this uh, uh, nonlinearity? Let's think of a linear neuron. So it's just doing a sum of x times w. If we build an enormous network, but everything is linear, we can reduce the network to just one equation. So we have no computational power if we have no nonlinearity. For this reason, this f is essential. Now, after defining uh, the single element, uh, the neuron, let's see how we can connect uh, many neurons to create a network. In Almaden, our project uh, is using, for example, this very simple network. We have four layers. The first one has 528 uh, neurons. The last one has 10 output neurons. And then we have two hidden neurons layers, which are 250 and 125. These neurons are connected. How? For example, the first one is connected to all the neurons of the second layer through weights. And this kind of connection is repeated for all the neurons. And for this reason, this topology is called a fully connected network, because all the neurons are connected to all the neurons of the subsequent and preceding layers. Now, we have this network. What does this network? The answer is nothing, because this network is completely unspecialized. The weights are completely random. So we need to specialize this network for solving a particular task. For example, in our simple case, we decide to classify these images, which are just handwritten digits taken from the MNIST data set, which is a common data set in machine learning. They are 60,000 images, like that, where there are numbers written by hand. And then we have 10,000 images used for testing this network. It is a very simple problem. And uh, now we will use the 60,000 elements to train this network. For example, let's start. We have all the weights which are random. We take the first image, which is by chance a one, and we do forward propagation of this image, which means that we apply values of the pixels at the first layer, and we propagate the information through the last layer. What we obtain is 10 outputs, so we have 10 numbers here. Since this network is completely random, the output values will be completely random. We would like to have as the highest output value the value corresponding to 1, because at the input the image was a 1. But of course, at the first stage, we will not have this result. After that, we will compare the output results with what we would like to obtain as a result. So the ground truth, the correct answer. In this case, we would have 1, 0, 0, and all the other zeros. After that, we just do the difference. And we calculate the correction, which is called delta. And now we do the back propagation of this error through the entire network. So from the last layer, we go back to the first layer. After that, we do the third stage, which is we update all the weights. How can we update these weights? We, ju oh, sorry. we just apply this quantity. So every weight is changed by this delta w, which is equal to this very simple formula, learning rate, which is a number, x, which was the value of the neuron during forward propagation, and delta, which is the value of the neuron during back propagation. This operation is repeated then many times for every image of the training set. And then we repeat this entire training set, many iterations, so to obtain good results. Now, this network, Note that we are using 10 outputs because we have 10 possible digits, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. If we have, like, for example, letters of the alphabet, we will have a different number of outputs. Now, this network can give us many opportunities from a hardware point of view. For example, we can think of doing the training on a computer, and then we have all the weights, the real value of the weights, and we load them into a chip which is specialized in doing 
just forward inference, so, so just the classification, but really fast. And this is a, an hardware which already exists. It is IBM True North chip, was developed like a couple of years ago, and now it works. And then there's a second option, which is not doing the training on a software, so on a computer, but doing the training directly on the chip. So we have both training and forward inference in the same chip. Why this thing uh, is interesting for us? Uh, it's because training operation is slow, but dramatically slow. The huge networks, for example, the ones we are, which are used by Google, by Facebook, and so on, they need to be trained for like uh, three, four weeks, uh, not on one computer, but on uh, uh, clusters of GPUs. So you can understand the problem is really a large problem because these companies cannot wait uh, one month for having results from a training a network. And for this reason, we want to develop some hardware, a chip, which is able to train big networks faster and at lower power. Now, let's see how the modern technology works on just a single layer, just to understand how it works. The basic operation is the multiply and accumulate operation, so we just calculate this sum of x times w, and this is performed today with GPUs, uh, graphical processing units. And they work pretty fine because they are optimized for that. Uh, but still, they are spending a lot of time uh, moving data due to the von Neumann uh, architecture and von Neumann bottleneck. They spend a lot of time moving from memory to the processor. Our dream uh, would be to reduce the distance, the physical distance between the memory and the processor. Ideally, it would be nice to do the calculations inside the memory. So, Let's see now a little bit more about the memory, because we want to do something with memory. Let's understand what the memory community and memory researchers can provide us. This is a typical hierarchy of memory on a computer. We have like a CPU, which its corresponding memory. And this memory is really fast, because it must cope with the CPU calculations. And the access time is around one nanosecond, so super fast. After that, we have a DRAM, which is the second level, a little bit slower, but still around tens of nanoseconds. After that, and you all know when you use your computer, when you access your disk, your hard disk, times become really uh, longer. In this case, we have access times around one millisecond. So you can notice there's a huge gap between the DRAM and the hard disk. The memory community for like 15 years, they wanted to fill this gap with something. So they wanted something which was blurring the edge between this region and this region. And they wanted to develop something which, so a new memory, able to be solid state, so nothing which is moving, fast, fast non-volatile, so if we turn off the electricity, the memory still stays there. With a high endurance means where we can program the device a lot of times, so we can program the memory many times. And after that, it must be cheap, because that's always really interesting for industries. This memory is called generically storage class memory. And there are three main candidates for this role, which are phase change memory, resistive memory, and magnetic memory. These memories exploit different physical behaviors but the main concept is just one. I want a device where I can change the resistance, the electrical resistance of the device, by just applying a voltage pulse. And in this way, I can memorize different memory states by just having different resistance states. In our project in IBM, we use this phase change memory, which is quite simple as a device. The physics is not really simple, but the idea is simple. If we want to have a low conductance state, we need to have a material which is amorphous. Instead, so the lattice is uh, disorder. If we, have, uh, if we want to have something which is high conductance, we use a material which is crystalline. There is a material which is uh, the GST, uh, which is a calcogenide, where we can reversibly switch between this state and this state uh, by just applying voltage pulses. And so we have a memory. For example, here there's a sketch of this memory where we have our, an amorphous region here, the blue one. This corresponds uh, to a high resistance low conductance. But then, if we apply voltage pulses, we can gradually change the resistance of the device up to a high conductance situation where the amorphous region is almost disappeared. This device exists. It's not in production, but uh, 
Intel is trying to make it uh, in production. And, uh, and so we are using this one. These devices uh, are organized in very simple architecture, which are called crossbar arrays. So you can select one device by just selecting the corresponding word line and bit line. Every device is just in series with a selector, which is an element to access the single memory. I want to go there. Please turn it on. So in memory, what happens is that we have uh, the ability of reading one single cell by just uh, using an address decoder, which turns on the entire word line. And then we read the corresponding current uh, by just uh, using the sense amplifiers, which read the current. They are able to sense two levels, 0 or 1, because we are memorizing bits, not an analog value. But still, it works. Now, from a neuromorphic point of view, this is really interesting. But we want to change something to be able to do what we really are interested in. So we will take the same array, crossbar array, but we will change the peripheral circuitry. No more address decoders and sense amplifiers, but we will have, for example, first layer of neurons and second layer of neurons. Now, we know that two neurons are connected through a weight. The weight here is encoded in a couple of devices. We take the value of the conductance of this device and the value of the conductance of this device, and we do this difference by just reading differentially these two currents. And this is how we encode the weight. So it's in the conductance of the devices. Now, we want to do this operation, sum of x times w. Well, the product is quite easy. We just use Ohm's law. We apply a voltage, and the voltage is multiplied through a conductance, and this gives us a current, and we read this current. Then we need to do the summation. We just activate all the neurons, so we have every single current contribution, and we sum these contributions thanks to Kirchhoff's current law. So we perform this operation really easily in this kind of arrays, and we perform calculation directly in memory. That's why this structure is appealing for neuromorphic computing. Then, and this is important, these neurons must read the current not as 0 or 1, but as an analog value, because we are interested in the real analog value of the weights, not in a, just knowing if it is 0 or 1. Now, you can see this structure just represents a part of a deep learning network, because we have just one layer here, one neurons, weight layer, and the output neurons. But we want to uh, train large networks uh, where we have a lot of layers. For this reason, we can think of our chip uh, as this order structure where we have a lot of different uh, arrays. Uh, and these arrays are connected through routing networks. And, uh, this chip, uh, which still does not exist, uh, this is what we are trying to do, should be able to receive information from the output, uh, uh, precisely the examples, the, so the one, and the corresponding label, so the one, uh, the, the image is a one. Then we must also be able to communicate to the output uh, the result of, uh, the train of the classification. So, hey, the image you sent me, it was a one. After that, we need also to be able to uh, send to the output the outdated weights, because this chip wants to train the network. So we want to calculate the output weights, but we need to then communicate to the output world. After that, we also need to be able to uh, perform weight override. So we want to use this chip in a more parallel and distributed computing scheme, where we have more chips, and these chips need to talk uh, one to the other one. Now, let's suppose we have this chip. But this chip, if we want to have something which is commercially competitive with the technology of today, what this chip should have? This chip should be low power, faster, not of the technology of today, but of the GPUs of the next few years, because we are studying something, but also NVIDIA is studying something for GPUs. So we need to do better than them in the next years. And then we need to be also as accurate as nowadays technology. So we want to train the network really well, not more or less. These regions are of zero interest. We don't like them because this chip would be a loser. 
But then there are two situations where there's some interest. This one, a chip which is low power and accurate. This is good for situations where we have constraints in power, like in cars, where we cannot use uh, lots of watts. And then this situation, where we have a chip which is accurate and faster than technology. In this case, we can have uh, an application in servers uh, where we are not really concerned about power consumption. Finally, there's the sweet spot, which is the center. We have all the three points, uh, and so we are happy, and we can sell our chip uh, with no trade-offs. Now, let's see what we are doing uh, in Almaden for this kind uh, of uh, chip. Let's start from accuracy. The first work uh, from the group uh, is this one from June 2014, so it's quite recent work. The accuracy on the MNIST data sets, so on the numbers, was quite low, actually. It was around 82%. And this was obtained with a particular experiment where we were using real devices. It was a mixed hardware and software experiment. And we were doing everything in software, except any operation performed on PCM was performed on physical real PCMs. Then we were reading the conductance, sending the conductance to the software, and repeating, uh, okay, and repeating the operation many times. So we were reaching a, a low accuracy. If we were using GPUs, uh, we would need to have 94% test accuracy. If we were using 5,000 examples, this was done with 5,000 examples because the experiment was taking uh, a lot of time. And uh, if we were using the entire data set, we would need to have 97%. So we were quite far away. Why? Because the real device, uh, PCM is not uh, as good as we really want. There are many non-idealities for, non for neuromorphic stuff. For example, if we want to, this first plot uh, just shows how the conductance behave as we apply voltage pulses to increase the device conductance. We have some devices which are dead, so they have zero conductance, some devices which are always on, and some devices which are having different behaviors. So the maximum conductance is different. We have different curves every time. There's a stochasticity of programming. Sometimes we ask, please increase the conductance, and then the conductance decreases, which is bad. And then we have particular nonlinearity of the, of the device. After that, we have also asymmetry of the conductance behavior. So set transition goes, in one, goes gradual, but the reset transition, the decrease, is very bad. Now, this was having an impact uh, on the network because we, the weights uh, were steering the network towards zero. And so this was really bad because the network was frozen. All the weights were zero. The information was not passing anymore. So I will just skip this slide. We were able to model the nonlinearity of the device and study the effects uh, into our simulator, which was this one. And, uh, Doing that, we were able also to study all the single different effects in the simulator. And uh, all this knowledge led us to nowadays results. Now we are able, with the same devices, to obtain a higher accuracy around 97%, which is uh, uh, in line with what GPUs can obtain. Of course, uh, this has been done with a new structure. And uh, I'm not allowed to describe it. so. I hope one day I can, but they don't allow me. So at least in the accuracy, we are OK. Now let's see what we need to do to be faster than uh, GPUs. We know the good point is that we are reading, uh, in a parallel fashion, uh, these uh, arrays. Well, we are reading parallel, and we are doing parallel computation. This is good, but in reality, we are doing uh, an almost parallel. We are taking some columns. Uh, and uh, we are multiplexing these columns because we have just one capacitor and one analog to digital converter. Why we have this? Because physically, we don't have space to make the circuitry for just one column of weights. If we define CS as the number of columns which are shared between the same circuitry, we, need, we observe that the training time, of course, goes down if we reduce the number of uh, columns which are shared. Our ideal situation would be having just one. So we have a trade-off here. We would like to have circuit sharing one. So we would have having the same circuit for every column. But for doing that, we need to do circuitry which is small. 
And for doing small circuitry, we need to make some approximations in the functions we ask to the neurons. So we don't ask for a very precise neuron, but at least it is compact. So there's a trade-off which must be, must be taken into account. Now we tape out uh, two array diagnostic monitors to study this, and now we are studying this, uh, these structures. One has just one array, and the other one has two arrays which are connected, so we can implement a basic input layer, hidden layer, and output layer. And uh, actually, this is what I'm doing now. And these are the images of the two ADMs and the corresponding macros. Now, I will just skip to the second part. Uh, we know that uh, backpropagation is what I've described now. It is uh, basically what people thought the brain was doing uh, in the 40s. Now we know the brain is not doing uh, this kind of computation, but we have different kinds of computation. Spike time independent plasticity is a novel protocol which has been really measured in uh, biological cells. Let's take, for example, this structure. And this, uh, uh, by the way, this uh, protocol allows to program the device. So we are not programming through backpropagation. We are programming through uh, uh, STDP. So let's consider a situation where there's a pre-neuron connected through a synapse to a post-neuron. If the pre-neuron fires before the post-neuron, the synapse undergoes potentiation, so the conductance of the synapse increase. Instead, if the post-neuron fires before the pre-neuron, the conductance decreases. This very simple algorithm can give us some computational power. Uh, for example, there have been some works, uh, this one from IBM and Yorton Heights uh, in New York, where we are implementing the weight with a phase change memory element, and we can program the device based on the relative timing of these two pulses. The structure is the same as before, but what is different is that now we are sending spikes because we are interested in the relative timing. This is also the curve corresponding to the, S this is the SDB curve, so basically this curve, obtained from real devices. By the way, you notice the huge scatter. This is the scatter of real novel devices, so it's not always easy to cope with them. There are also other structures, for example, this one where we can use a, a simpler structure with just one device and a corresponding selector. I will just keep the explanation of this, but we have the description of the learning of one pattern. For example, you can see here, this is an unsupervised learning, so it's okay for interacting with real world. We have an input, uh, which is a one with uh, some sort of noise uh, on it. And we can see this is the map of uh, the conductances of the devices. Uh, we have uh, the devices corresponding to the map, which are potentiated, while all the others are depressed. And so at the end, uh, this network, which was unspecialized uh, through the STDP, is now specialized uh, on this pattern and can recognize it. STDP also allows to do something a little bit more complicated, which is classifying many different images. Here, I have a system where I'm showing, with the same probability, 10 different numbers, 10 digits. And this network, which is a little bit complicated, has different uh, maps corresponding to different devices, uh, conductance maps. And we notice that at the end, the network is able to specialize and recognize all the different numbers in an unsupervised way. So this is a very basic but meaningful computational operation. Now, last part of my presentation. Up to now, I've told you that uh, we are memorizing weights uh, with this couple of devices. But none prevents us from uh, doing something better or something new. Here, this is, we have different operations, uh, different options. The first one is use different uh, non-volatile memories. Between the non-volatile memories we have now, there are many kinds. The problem is that all the memories we have now, they are non-linear and asymmetric. So they work quite bad, exactly as our 82% in the first experiment. The second option is to completely avoid uh, non-volatile memories and just use CMOS technology because we would like to have a device which is linear. This is good. If the device is linear, they're super nice. Capacitors are linear. The problem is that they are leaky, and they have also 
larger cells, so we are wasting a lot of our area. Finally, there's a third way of operating, which is let's create a new device, an improved device. This would be like the best device, but it still does not exist. There are many groups that are trying to do that, but it's not easy. Let's see what the future will give us. After that, I will just give you a thought about uh, this more complicated structure. Nowadays, uh, all the operations regarding uh, image recognition are done with these convolutional networks, uh, which are a little bit more complicated than the fully connected networks I described before. These networks are huge uh, with many, many layers. We have convolutional layers for almost all the section of the, net of, of the network, and just the last uh, one or two layers are fully connected. This structure is, works like that. This first part uh, just recognizes features from the image, like there's a curve, there's a line, there's a number, and so on. While the last part, uh, what it does is putting together these features oh, and then uh, giving a, a classification output. So for example, if there's a line, there's a 6, a 0, we have this kind of image. But the reason why we have just two layers here and a lot of convolutional layers here is because uh, these convolutional layers have reduced number of weights, while convolutional, uh, while fully connected layers have a lot of weights, so they are computationally expensive to train. For this reason, what's happening is that uh, people are studying these networks uh, because NVIDIA is providing them uh, this kind of accelerators, so accelerators which work well for this structure. They are not trying new architectures, but if we can provide uh, to the machine learning scientists uh, new structures, new accelerators, uh, where we can train, for example, fully connected la and layers very fast, uh, probably there could be a new network uh, which is working even better. So this is something we really don't know, but at least we would give to the uh, machine learning scientists uh, novel possibilities. So finally, I would like to just give some uh, thoughts was on what the device people should do. From a neural network point of view, up to now there have been a lot of studies from different universities and companies, but based only on small data sets, for example, the MNIST, which is the one of the numbers. But we need to go to larger data sets, uh, for example, this CIFAR 10, CIFAR 100, ASVHN, this is Street View house numbers. So from Street View, uh, we are taking the numbers of the houses uh, and we are classifying them. It's really difficult because they are colored, they have different shapes, uh, different positions, and so on. Then the last one, this ImageNet, this is the typical uh, benchmark for neural networks today. If we go to larger data sets, the problem is that we need uh, huge neural networks, and this leads to a large amount of weights. So we have large memory arrays uh, with all the problems for the memory, uh, like reliability, uh, endurance of the devices, symmetry of devices, and then other technological problems. Then from an architectural point of view, we have multiple ma arrays, and we want to connect them efficiently, because if we are really fast in calculating one layer, but then we are, we we are losing all our time in communicating uh, between different layers, we there is no advantage. So this is also something really difficult to perform. And also from a theoretical point of view, there are some issues. The first one is what I mentioned before about uh, what is the best network, so convolutional, many layers, for solving particular problems. And then for STDP, it's really interesting, but we need a lot of new theory about uh, how it really works on large systems. So in conclusion, today I've just uh, uh, given uh, an overview of what we have done in uh, IBM in training neural networks with uh, non-volatile memories. Now we have competitive performance on MNIST, but we need to solve all the subsequent problems. Then we notice that we need a very efficient, uh, area efficient peripheral circuitry. I also described a little bit uh, what is uh, non-volatile memories for STDP, so this uh, biological protocol. And then I just mentioned some challenges uh, in uh, cognitive computing for uh, device people and also architecture people. Thank you.
uh, you are asking uh, how can make the conductance not increase too much. Uh, that's a good question. This is uh, probably one of the easiest things to do because uh, our devices have a physical limit. Uh, we cannot go up over a certain uh, conductance. So if we are at maximum conductance, uh, if we ask please increase, uh, the device does not increase anymore. This is something we also have in our brain. The synapses cannot uh, potentiate uh, over a certain threshold. So that's something already but built in. But the limits have to be added on, right? Yes. Absolutely, absolutely. There's a difference between uh, what we have, uh, like for example, in uh, computer science. Uh, neural networks in computer science have weights which are typically unbounded. But uh, we need to have weights which are bounded just because real weights are real devices which have limited uh, range. Fortunately, this uh, kind of saturation is not uh, the limiting factor for these networks. Uh, so we can deal with it. Yes. Oh, OK. Uh, that's a good point. Uh, Nonlinearity is done here in the neuron because uh, Nonlinearity is inside, uh, it's one of the operations of the neurons, so it is done here, which is a CMOS circuitry. Can you apply it there as well? Uh, the bias uh, is just, uh, we just add, uh, an, like uh, we can consider putting another extra line here, which is uh, the bias, and then we can train it uh, as we train all the other uh, weights. Yes. Uh, I, I, I don't know if it is confidential, but since I don't want to be fired, I will not reply. Uh, I don't know how to reply <laughs> to this kind of uh, stuff. But I will ask, uh, if you give me the email, I ask if I can tell you, and I tell you. Well, that's a great question. This is, if not problem number one, it's problem number two of these devices. So these devices have a lot of variability. You have seen the experimental results for the STDP curve, but it's the same here. So actually what's going on is that we need to deal with this variability. The nice thing of these structures of neuromorphic is that since we are reading the sum of all the currents, actually there's an averaging effect which reduces the impact of variability. While variability is super bad for memory applications because you're reading exactly this device and then if this device is wrong, your read is wrong, in this case, you are reading the entire column, so there's a little bit more tolerance to variability. Any other questions? All right, well, thank you very much. Thank, thank you. Thank you. It's very interesting. Thank you. I, I need to accelerate in one point because I, I was looking no, no, at the. That's fine. That's fine. That's good. We can have time too, but it's. Uh, and they're not going to learn everything, but at least it's going to be Absolutely. Uh, yes. So that's very interesting on how you connect. And this. <laughs> Hi. Nice to meet you. Yeah, I'm Saptarshi. Uh, Stefan. So I had one question. Yes. Because I worked on uh, relative random access memories. Oh, yes. In my master. Okay, okay. Actually, I did my PhD in uh, RAMs. Oh, okay. Now I'm, I'm sold to the new device, but I, I have a background in RAMs. What sort of material did you use? Afnium dioxide. Yes. Yeah. Do you have uh, also a transistor in series? Like, uh, yes. So we, we did 
we did some, uh, we just used like simple integrated fire neurons um, basically. I see. Let the women move outside and continue with the questions. Absolutely. Okay, uh, just let me close this computer. Hi. So, uh, is there any image data set for which the error is so much that this fails? So the array is? The error is like so much. Uh, well, the error uh, comes from the accuracy. I'm, uh, so yes, if you go to large data sets,